So can I frame sure. the situation? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so... Here, let me get on this side. Um, we want to talk about the evolution of consciousness yes. and focus in particular on the last 500 years, um, roughly, since, you know, the since Europeans um, and uh, North and South American indigenous peoples made contact with each other. And I know I'm using America as the name for this place, but that wasn't the original name. I'm sure it had many names um, by the various peoples that were here. Anyways, what has transpired and how is it um, shaping the current political climate today where in America, which is where we are, where we grew up and what we can speak to, I think most concretely Mm -hmm. and effectively, hopefully. Um, Right now, in this country, we just had four years of Trump, which in American history was a pretty significant um, moment. Uh, Many would say a dark moment. Others would say um, a great moment. (laughs) But there's this split in the interpretation of not only history, but the interpretation of um, what we as a nation ought to do. Yeah. So we talked in our last... Sofa Sophie, though, we're a little bit out of character here. We're actually not on the sofa. We're walking. So this is more peripatetic, I guess. So we'll just go with it. But um, yes. we're talking about wokeism and Trumpism. We didn't talk too much about Trumpism, actually. Maybe we can get more into that now. But at the same time, there seems to be a great awakening to a history of racial injustice and just woven into the founding yeah. DNA of this country. But at the same time, there's this great and darkening happening, or terrible and darkening, that is leading to a rise in nationalism and racism and um, factionalism. And I'll I'll even say that that and darkening is not just on the right. Definitely is happening on the right, but it's also happening among... It's like a general cloud that covers everything. Yeah, and I don't think we can just pin it on somebody else. Yeah. It's It's in all of us. Yeah, I think so too. I think everybody's... Well, I guess some people are extreme in their um, certainty. And others are just totally confused. (laughs) And just trying to, I guess, attune to things as they unfold so as to know, I guess, the contours of whatever is unfolding. Would you say most people are confused? I don't know. Even those who claim or seem to be certain... You think they still have moments of doubt and well, shame, I, even? You know, if they're really feeling human, <laughs> well, I, hope I think so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? We're at risk in our current moment with all the distractions and the media, the, the, the um, alienating environments within which we live. We're all at risk of failing yeah. to be fully human. It is, it is. There's like this the feeling that I would characterize it with is the feeling of everything collapsing into it you know into one thing mm-hmm. or where there's not as much differentiation like even just media the media can media consumption. one thing say more about it but one thing like one world like yeah so we're all crowded into this almost one. like this kind of flow of like determined flow mm. You know, I was just reading some Teilhard de Chardin, and I know you uh, look forward to reading him, but he talks about the no-sphere emerging yeah. at the end of so this. Brian. And, you know, Brian Swim. And Brian Swim's got this whole... Um, the Human Energy Project. Human Energy Project on YouTube. Check it out. It's about the emergence of the no-sphere, which is the intellectual or spiritual sphere that emerges out of the biosphere, which emerged out of the, you know, geosphere and... Um, Tehar describes the process though as like the crowding of masses of human beings around the planet and just how the human species has he was already saying like in the 30s, 40s, 50s that okay human beings are going to drive every other species of plant and animal into extinction dominate the planet what does that mean biologically, evolutionarily Yeah. for him it meant a new layer of nature was emerging 
which mm-hmm. isn't just life anymore. Yeah. But his mind is um, spiritual. Yeah. And the whole planet, he thought, was being spiritualized by human activity, even where that activity seemed really violent on the surface. I yeah. mean, war, the being at, on the front lines of World War I is what awoke Tehard to the emergence of the noosphere, ultimately. War, yeah. as Heraclitus says, is the father of all things. And so, you know, in our situation now, I hope we cannot have war. Yeah. Maybe... Maybe, you know, the thought I just had was that Steiner, you know, had a similar, I guess, vision of the future. Rudolf Steiner? Yeah, Rudolf Steiner, the, he called it the Jupiter, the Jupiter phase, I guess, or something like that, where mm. the Earth becomes spiritualized, mm-hmm. and it's like nothing will be the same as it is now. Yeah. And, you know, and just a similar, similar, I guess you know, uh, foregrounding of Anthropos and, right. Um, but they were also, so maybe what they were experiencing, you know, both is, was a kind of like clairvoyant feeling of the future Mm -hmm. and it was, you know, interpreted according to, Mm. you know, the context of their time. Yeah. I mean, Steiner interpreted it in, t- in terms of German idealism and theosophy and yeah. Tehard interpreted it in terms of paleontology and biological evolution. Yeah. That's... And, and also, like, you know, their personal historical... Like, I was just thinking, I was like, this, the... Um, ha- whether or not, like, the idea of Darwinism and competition has influence the theories of the evolution of consciousness Mm. we're approaching a very loud um motorway where dozens of cars are streaming by and they're very loud so let's pause and return to these thoughts in a second yes i brought up darwinism and competition in relation to theories of the evolution um yeah i was gonna say you know i think that is an interesting thing to connect the way that we talk about uh, ecology today and evolution is not necessarily being exclusively co- competitive and these new theories in relation to things like that Yeah. and consider that like when we think about the evolution of consciousness because yeah because then there's like the human the different human groups aren't necessarily actually separate you know from each other Right, but clearly, I mean, over the history of our species, which, yeah, it's one species, but there have been, there has been competition um, between groups of humans Uh because of cultural or what has historically been been called racial differences, and there's the whole debate about the extent to which race is even a meaningful category biologically, or clearly it is socially because of the effects of racism, but um, the point is there has been a competition among different racial groups, however we define that term, even if it's a construct, it well, defines some yeah. boundary between different groups of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it doesn't lose its, uh, I guess, necessity or meaning, maybe it change, its meaning changes a little bit when we're no longer, you know, bifurcating nature and culture. Right. That's, that's, you know, I guess that's why there's this now category of identity politics, because that's recognized, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Identity is constructed and still real. Yeah, exactly. And... And so these are realities, even though, you know, we're no longer operating in the kind of scientific, well, bifurcation point of view. Right. But the thing is about um, construction is that it's not just social. Yeah, um, exactly. Biology, biological evolution is itself, mm-hmm. has, was all, always already a constructive, creative yeah. process with yeah. learning and what, what usually, all the stuff we think is just cultural um, mm-hmm. is was cosmic. already there, is cosmic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so like culture and nature mm-hmm. still are terms we can use to distinguish but not divide. Right, and so how does... we're both indexed to something that unites them. 
So when we think about evolution, not just biologically, but um, socially and culturally, we have this unfortunate, I think, um, stain on our collective history, which is about 100 years ago, right, with the birth of eugenics. I mean, you know, 150 to basically after Darwin and up until the World Wars. Yeah. Eugenics was like, duh, of course we have to do that, you know? And then, yeah. and then the Holocaust happened. Mm-hmm. When that racialized science was deployed against specific groups of people, races, um, and, and the handicapped and disabled, and people were eradicated purely for supposed scientific genetic reason it's like pulling weeds out of the garden you know it's tragic abstraction right that's what it is it's like you know i don't know it just feels like you know that kind of when when you do something wrong it really tarnishes yourself you know and that's i guess what i'm thinking of yeah uh, in relation to that kind of well, into but racialized violence and genocide. So how do we now, you know, 100 years roughly later, um, almost 100 years after the Holocaust, but eugenics was very big in the United States, especially before World War II. How do, but how do we bring evolution back into the conversation? Because we can't deny that it happens. <laughs> well, but, but without, um, you know, instigating race wars because we're clearly on the verge of that we, well the whole history of america is a race war in some sense um mm-hmm. given if you took a non-white perspective yeah. on it <laughs> totally yeah defending territory trying to re- continue to exist right and maintain languages and stories and that's Freedom. like a war yeah, yeah. um so it's i think what 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 the struggle is now uh, deeper than the the partisan division between left and right or trumpets and wokists or whatever deeper than that is this struggle at the species level to to evolve Mm -hmm. and the tensions within the species mind or the noosphere are um yeah they're like adversaries that are uh, at odds with each other, but generative of growth. Uh huh. And so, what? I mean, well, you know, these things are happening. Happening that you know, where every group, no matter what you think, is experiencing climate change, right? And the corona pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. Mm-hmm. And so, those two things, like, kind of have the potential to um, gesture towards something shared <laughs> about the whole human species. Well, um, yeah, that's right on. There, it makes me think that there are some things that are standing in the way of our coming to share Yeah, those common realities. and like what. Because that's all anyone wants, I think. Mm. Truly, mm-hmm. that's the good. Mm-hmm. You know, among human beings. Yeah. But there's so much blindness. And, like, wounding. And, yeah. And also just, like, practical realities. that And, like, unfair realities. Mm-hmm. That are, we're all kind of, like, awaken. So, you know, the counterpoint to the evolution of consciousness... Um, story that, or theory that we would use to interpret history. There's the more Marxist and materialist understanding of history, right? It's just um, culture being this superstructure of the real causal layer, which is material conditions and reproduction of the species biologically and socially. And whoever basically owns the capital is in charge of the production of culture and society and there's no way for like the realm of ideas to ever change that basic um law Mm -hmm. and i think that's too reductionistic but i also think it can't be ignored yeah and so 
when we talk about racial justice, for example, it has, I think, less to do with making sure there are a representative um, percentage of black <coughs> billionaires or gay yeah. billionaires or gay black female CEOs or whatever. It's not about a quota of the elite, racial quotas and gender quotas at, of, among the elite. It's about not having elites. Yeah. Or at least elites being um, well, excelling citizens. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that w- everyone looks up to. Right. Not, not like that is oppressing other people. <laughs> yes, and money is not a metric of excellence. Yeah, it's just not. Yeah, because then it becomes uh, uh, idolatrous, or right. Yeah. So racial justice is more about reparations, I think. Yeah. Um, but and transformation. I don't think you can disentangle the crimes committed um, by capitalism and, and the predominantly white yeah, I, I um, agree. owners. You can't, uh, you can't differentiate race from class yeah, in the so. history of capitalism. And so reparations is, yes, definitely, obviously owed to the descendants of slaves, yeah. of enslaved people, um, enslaved Africans. It's obvious. But uh, there's a lot of reparations that would need to occur for justice to be served. Well, maybe that's why there's so much resistance and inertia, because everybody's just caught up and exhausted in this, and you know, by late capitalism, mm-hmm. and everybody's just on survival mode, and yeah, you know, like these deep species wounds, you know, of like, well, of just existing in that kind of paradigm because you just have to see people suffering all the time and you have to suffer and or you have to like walk past somebody who's suffering here you know Mm -hmm. so capitalism creates an atomized condition of society that pits individuals against one another and systematically um disrupts the attempts for community and and commonality and a shared sense of destiny to arise like it the whole advertising industry and social media too they're all like their whole function is to atomize us into consumers that need their products to survive because we have no social connections to our neighbors yeah yeah and they really um they condition people with like almost transhumanist Mm. Uh, desires, yeah. you know, to be like young and beautiful forever. Right, right. And if even if you're aging, like next year's iPhone will have an awesome camera that will filter out your wrinkles, and like you can look young forever on your profile. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's this surrogate religion of transhumanism or techno humanism. It gives us, like, a future to look forward to that's going to be better. But it's all a mirage. Yeah, yeah. I saw Grimes on her Twitter. She said, <clears throat> can't wait to die in the, on the red Mars dirt or something like that. Can't wait to die with the red Mars dirt between my toes or something like that. I was like, oh, man, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> yeah, I mean... At least not to be the first ones. At least she's not trying to... Escape death. Yeah. <laughs> it's one bad enough to escape the earth. And yeah, it is interesting though, you know, to consider like what kind of art would come from an artist on another planet. I would love to see that. And I like her music, so. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see like how the um, Wild West like social norms and, and class hierarchy plays out on Mars because you know, Elon. <laughs> is gonna or whoever gets there first it's it gonna be like, cyber trucks everywhere well if it's elon musk or let's say it's jeff bezos that gets there first i know elon's ahead now but bezos is about to reach orbit kind of leapfrogging musk right that is really interesting yeah see this adds to the shared experience of being planetary it's mm-hmm. like it's like and and also all the ufo well it's phenomena. it's it's the um it's the ritualized, like, expression of the transhumanist religion. Yeah. And the thing about the transhumanist religion is its, its sacraments are, like, rocket fuel uh, and 
you know, soil samples from Mars. Like, that's because it's driven by techno science. Oh, there should be fiction. <clears throat> like sci fi fantasy that um, kind of like breaks through the transhumanist imagination into something more archetypally informed. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure it exists, but yeah, I haven't read like it. Like Platonic. Yeah. So if Musk falls behind oh, and. and um, Jeff Bezos gets to Mars first, like, you know he's going to design society to mirror, like, an Amazon factory floor, and he's going to be, like, shipping over workers to, um... Oh, God. ...take care of yeah. the space base, or, or the Mars base that he's building, and, you know, it's going to reproduce an even more dystopian version of the class hierarchy on Earth, and... Oh, no. Yeah. That's like a weed getting into someone else's garden or something. Yeah. Um... Uh, but, you know, it might all be a pipe dream. Who knows? It might not really be feasible to set up shop on another planet. We might be dramatically underestimating our abilities to survive outside the environmental context and sheltering of mm-hmm. the moon and the, the, just the rhythms of the earth and yeah. the seasons of the earth and the yearly, like, um, metamorphosis that this planet goes through. It's like woven into our bodies. You stick us on another planet. It's like ripping out an invisible umbilical cord we didn't know we still had. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, it might be, yeah, these uh, uh, space missions that reveal to us something about the cosmos that we didn't... Like, something, like, big, I guess. Mm -hmm. Not just detailed about Mars or something, but something that changes the way we think of the cosmos. So... There might be a speciation event coming up where some of us, or no longer us, I guess, they leave Earth and they go to Mars or they go to space or whatever, but for the rest of us who stay here, because, I don't know, I guess I'll be an Earthist, at least for now, I feel like I'm not ready to give up on this place yet. Yes. The mothership. (laughs) Me too. Um, You know, that that scene in uh, Star Wars where they blow up Princess Leia's home, mm -hmm. I was... I was so disturbed by that, and I just felt so much sympathy with her that that's how I feel about Earth. That is typical, or it typifies the planetary era, right, is the recognition. I think first... Everything you've ever known. The recognition first among the indigenous people of of this continent, when Europeans got here, that the world could end, and that their world was actually way more fragile than they realized. Yeah. And then it took another few hundred years, several hundred, but the Europeans then realized that this whole planet is a lot more fragile Mm -hmm. than they realized. And now we're awakening to that, what was depicted in Star Wars and many other sci-fi films of, like, the possibility of planetary destruction. I mean, humans have only been capable of imagining that for a few centuries. Yeah. We had other versions of Apocalypse, I guess, but... This is, um, I think, uniquely gargantuan yeah. <laughs> in proportion. It's an emergence. Mm-hmm. It is. I mean, gosh, there's so many things that are painful about today, this world. But it's also, I don't know, astounding to live through this all. Yeah. I've I've, been... Go ahead. No, you... I was just going to say, by observing it, um, I I feel like I've been taught by it to... to... that the the reality of a deeper teleology or Mm. intelligence. Right. Well, I was going to ask... I mean, I was going to say that we're both, I think... um, We both affirm reincarnation of some kind, which means that there's a larger arc of a a larger teleology, right, that proceeds through multiple lifetimes. And also, like, Mm -hmm. we are in that sense very much intimately connected to the past. 
yeah. to prior generations. They are, they are our ancestors and they are still here among us as us. <laughs> yeah. And there's also a deep future and we will still be here in a sense. Yeah. And that's um, literal, like, yes. but, but not like my individual ego gets to yeah, no. hang out reincarnated say, forever, but your some individuality. Deeper, right. Spirit, soul, something deeper than the persona that, yeah, very much probably associated with this body in this particular life. But if, if we do have that vision of some sort of reincarnational process and a larger journey beyond just this body, then I think it gives us, um, I mean, doesn't it, I feel more secure and empowered and capable of, um, being present to the, yeah, the difficulties of our moment. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> Otherwise you feel like you're just a visitor and you're like, why the hell is it so crazy here? <laughs> you know, I don't know what the hell to do. Right. And you don't take responsibility for anything. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I didn't, I, I didn't do that. Yeah. That's not mine. Yeah. I don't owe you nothing. Whereas if you, you know, <laughs> if you are the whole, then like the future is you and everything you're doing right now. Yeah. Some people might say, oh, well, that's all speculative. But, you know, I think it's what do you think happens when you die? Phenomenologically, it feels true. What do you, where did you come from? Where were you before you were born? Like, you have to ask these questions. Every seven-year-old asks these questions. There's this <laughs> lyric in Prince Rama that I thought was so beautiful. Uh, it's what, what, it was like, what, what did you look like when you were newly born? Um, what was it? Something like that. I'll have to find the lyric. But it just was a very transpersonal thing to say in almost like kind of loving parental way. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's more relatable just in a secular sense of like, you know, we all know we were infants once and we were helpless yeah. and we needed our mothers to take care of us and we all owe an infinite debt of gratitude to the, the being that birthed us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, all you have to do is make the analogy to the earth and we owe a debt of gratitude to that body too and that soul that life and so yeah like whether we ask the question of what we look like as infants or what our what our identity was before we were born i think it raises these deeper questions yeah yeah okay we will cross the creek so, I don't know, reincarnation might be one of the ingredients of a more um, integral world view to bring our species <clears throat> together into a more harmonious way of um, inhabiting the planet together. Yeah, Owen Barfield has an essay about it, mm. about that. Mm -hmm. He was just like, the essay was basically like, just consider it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's not like we have more evidence for an alternative. Yeah. Well, and like it also, I, the way he presented it made it seem as though it illuminated um, things that maybe we kind of unconsciously take for granted, I guess, in our experience. Yeah. Um, like it's kind of the opposite of a performative contradiction because it illuminates, I guess, performative underpinnings or something like that. You know so, what I mean? Yeah. I, it's... Um, and, and value. David Ray Griffin calls these hardcore common sense presuppositions. Yeah. We don't even know that we presuppose them often. Yeah. But I think some kind of um, pre-life and after-life sense of continuity of existence is presupposed by the type of consciousness and freedom and ethical, the capacity for ethical action that we do presuppose. Yeah. Um, even Kant, who denied we could have super sensible knowledge, still affirmed that, like, human morality absolutely depends on some conception of immortality. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Like, ongoing existence and responsibility. Yeah. And, I mean, he had a technical reason why, but I, I was going to ask you, like, what do you say in response to, um, a materialist who's like not even willing to grant like a Christian would or you know a, a, a typical 
American um, evangelical would say, well, of course there's afterlife and the good ones go to heaven and the rest of you go to hell. But a materialist who's like, no, there, there's not, that's not real. That's a delusion. There's no afterlife. There's no reincarnation. We're just meat. We're just meat and we decay and that's it. What would I say? Yeah, how would you like... I would ask them questions mm. to eliminate the epistemic... Mm -hmm. um, the, the beliefs about epistemology, I guess, and right. the metaphysical, you know... Okay, I so guess, let's pretend I'm, I'm a materialist. Okay. And consciousness is just, like, what my brain is doing, and it emerged when I was born, gradually, and it will gradually um, decay as my brain ages, and then when my heart stops beating and the blood start, stops flowing and my brain shuts down, I just flicker out of existence and it's like I never was. Uh -huh. Prove me wrong. <clears throat> well, I would just ask you how you think you know that. Because there is nowhere else for consciousness to go once the brain is decayed and gone. <clears throat> um. hmm. It's a pretty good argument. Well, but I have, I have a response. I'm just formulating it. Um, how did you reach that conclusion? Science. What do you mean by science? Uh, the study of the neurophysiology in the skull and... Um, the way that based on our measurements of brain activity that certain areas in the brain are related to certain functional capacities that humans possess while they're healthy and alive and that when those parts of the brain stop working or are removed or lesioned or whatever, they, the person can't feel that or can't do that anymore. And so it seems like there's a pretty clear relationship there between consciousness and neurophysiology and so well <clears throat> but um how can you deduce what produces consciousness from observation of materiality if you're using consciousness to make that determination well I mean it could be that consciousness is just a word or language game that we play and we think we say we're conscious but really that's that's just um, a, a sort of social habit that we have that we perpetuate because it makes us makes us feel good but and now I'm seeing I'm stumbling into soul contradiction because I just said that feelings weren't really happening Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah, I guess you know the way to respond to that is like, but is that really convincing? Does that feel makes me feel like correct? I'm smarter than you? Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I know the truth, and but you're still sort of using you know what we call consciousness to make those. Conclusions. That's just something a biological robot that evolved like we did would say. How do you know that? Richard Dawkins told me on his Twitter. Well, why does why does he? Why does it matter what he thinks? Oh, um, well, he's a retired professor for the public understanding of science at Oxford University. Okay. So. <laughs> so what? He's the expert. <laughs> He's the scientific priest. Yeah. Anyways, you caught me. I, I realized that I couldn't get out of that question. Oh, I was thinking of the philosophy of freedom. I'm a bad materialist. By Steiner, because mm. that's what he, he's like. You can't really, you know, build up a, I guess, a theory or conclusions about the world without going through consciousness and thinking. And so if you posit something else as the precondition of epistemology um, that's outside of consciousness, then it just isn't, it, it's contradictory. 
and it's just not <laughs> it's not logically consistent or, or empirically yeah and so that's his argument for the basically that which reincarnates mm-hmm. he's not arguing for it in that book but what he's arguing in that book is that that's also the precondition for freedom yeah and that is not dependent on the material world the body but it definitely needs it in order to incarnate and to make any kind of to have any agency in the cosmos or as much i guess so i mean a larger point here is that um these philosophical issues the sorts of ideas we have about ourselves are uh significant factors in in our political and social um situation right because if nobody has a convincing narrative or theory of what they are as a free being and and yeah how they can be um ethical agents and yes then nobody believes that that's possible and we kind of just fuck off and like become cynical become cynical pleasure seekers yeah yep get what's mine while i can yeah so that you know these might seem like that's why we need speculative ideas but they're actually required for a fulfilling life you know these the answers to these questions really matter yeah they do we need like art that really lures people into the uh, experience of it we got doja cat <laughs> yep planet her well this is what happens when art religion and science become fragmented Yeah, but I think I feel in pop music that there is this desire to, you know, re- reunite but that just don't know how to do it or it's working itself out. Yeah, in the capitalist context. Cuz I really do feel some kind of uh transpersonal aspiration in some of the music. Some of it, but most of it's still about sex, money and power. Yeah. No, I agree. And so there's this kind of weird intermixing of it. Maybe that's not even weird or new. No, I mean, those what else is there to value if you have no that's the kind of higher ethical black magic calling. manipulating of the phantasms. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if art is disconnected from religion entirely, it becomes illusion and disconnected from science entirely if it has no relation to the good or the true what's left for it to do but celebrate orgasm and purchasing power and fancy cars and big mansions it's and like it's like a yachts like a picture of the shadows on the walls mm. <laughs> yeah but you know we don't want like some kind of religious authority to be in charge of the beautiful either no so it's not a question of just like imposing a sacred order upon the artistic imagination but there needs to be more of a more of an interplay between these values right yeah yeah so get busy and make some art for us all right i'm going to i'm learning from the What was it that I was looking at? Um, the Har Monogon. It's that you heard me listening to it. It's a free geometrical instrument on the internet that teaches music theory with geometry, oh. and um, it's in the shape shape of a dodecagon. And uh, and yeah, super cool. But um, yeah. We should check it out. Make some better music that way. Yeah, geometry is both. It's one of the. I mean, it's an ancient system of knowledge. I mean, it's definitely evolved over the centuries, but it it's in its primordial source. It's like uniting the the true, the good, and the beautiful. Right. It's a. It's geometry. The geometrical relationships that can be abstracted from the world around us the natural world are clear indications that there is a ideal uh structure that underlies what's visible to us um i 
I just felt like I had a deepening of <clears throat> my understanding of the word geometry uh -huh. uh, in relation to the earth, geo, and what the earth is. Lay it on me. Well, I'm just ex uh, discovering through the sacred geometry course with Carrie Welch, uh, the, um, for example, the way the so, so many uh, dimensions of the nature are, and the human being are um, expressions of the Fibonacci sequence. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, there was also Robert Lawler suggesting that there's the harmonics of the relationships between the planets and that there's a kind of music produced and vibration and, you know, mass, energy are related to each other. So he suggested the idea that there's this kind of, you know, this is a kind of holism where the, the interrelationships, like, bring into being the conditions of the earth that support living beings. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so someone in this Quadrivium book I was reading was like, maybe these are things that we should look for when we're looking for planets. Uh, um, hmm. in the universe that could be bearing life. Um, and that's really interesting. I think that's a way of synthesizing the Neoplatonic with the materialist imagination of, like, this, you know, expanded cosmos hmm. infinitely yeah. fast. So look for other planets based on the proportions yes. that seem effective on earth and like the relations of the planets relative to each other yeah well that and all other things you know um but yeah but especially when you're looking for planets mm -hmm. um then you could look at like study the atmosphere of the planet um the you know potential planet um, right and then so on and so forth because weather patterns probably are related to life obviously mm -hmm. obviously it's amazing. It is. So, um... Evolution is a... Endless spiral. Yeah. And what goes around comes around. We are each in some way, responsible for everything that happens. Mm -hmm. I think, or at least that is the, um, that would be my mantra, at least. Like, this too is me. Yeah. <laughs> Thou art that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That's how you surf the spiral in a harmonious way, I think. I think so. <laughs> I think that's like the, what this sage has realized. Or actualized. Yeah. But it's not that recognition, thou art that, I am this, I am responsible for this. You can't yeah. be free unless you take responsibility for everything. Right? Yeah, I guess so. Because otherwise, the Buddhists are right, at least, that it's all a chain of causes and conditions. So yeah. You, you have to say, that's me. That is my will. <laughs> yeah. Whenever I hear... There are certain criticisms of, you know, the political, contemporary political, um, uh, how should I describe it, climate. Um, they're coming from like a spiritual point of view that say things like that. You know, that they're, they're just concerned about the identifying with, um, with, uh, what's the word? Um being oppressed, basically, being victims. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When that's, you know, that applies to anyone who feels that way. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that that's not part of, you know, like reparations. Um, mm -hmm. Because it is, it's a reality, but it's also yeah. not permanent. Yeah. So, you know, we have to use the skillful means and comport in the right way to every individual context and to always be different mm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's I mean I don't 
mean to make it sound like easy to to take responsibility and it's I don't mean to say that it's um, equally accessible to people at all socioeconomic um, uh-huh. yeah. locations um, there are there is a hierarchy that is um, yeah sort of imposed because of injustices historically that but you know when you see reincarnation as a reality it's like I too was that and whatever wherever you are on the social hierarchy or the racial hierarchy um, that's historically constructed and uh, enforced um, you've been on all sides in some past life of, yeah. of the power dynamic yeah and uh, you know I guess again to bring up from earlier that the condition of life for many people today is of survival so there is no you know space really to to feel that but there can be I guess um shouldn't rule it out uh um what was I gonna say what did you just say it was related we've all to been the master oh. and the oppressor yes the idea of reincarnation sorry the master and the oppressed yeah the idea of reincarnation is, I think, related to, well, yeah, like a transformation in identity because, you know, a lot of our allegiances in our lives are to our family or, you know, people that are in near proximity. But the idea of reincarnation, you know, as a reality of our, ourselves um, is... Uh, would kind of it wouldn't destroy the importance of the family or those closest mm. to us, but it would in a in a slightly relativize them because we would be you know more than those conditions, but they're definitely important right to who we are in that lifetime. Like you have been your parents' parents before, yeah. So it relativize like them in the sense not that you haven't always been in a relationship with each other in some form, but that. The nature of the relationships has been yeah. moving around. It becomes strange when you think that <laughs> way because we realize how conditioned we are to think, you know, especially today with certain psychological points of view or ideas about psychology and trauma and right. the parents. and mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember when someone kind of, I was expressing to a friend just like something I was experiencing that was difficult and he was like, He just brought this perspective in, basically, that kind of, well, relativized my (laughs) suffering. He didn't mean it to to be that way, but I guess that's how I experienced it. I was like, and I could experience my attachment to it. Hmm. Um, Because I couldn't conceive, I guess, yet of what, of, you know, of myself, uh, you know, in that way, as a being who's been here before. (laughs) Yeah. And is, you know, infinitely wiser than I can comprehend in my, you know, ego. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a profound realization or um, idea to affirm that not only have you been here before, but there's no beyond. There's no escape. Yeah. You're going to come back. This is the only, you know, place that there is to be. It's kind of like, you know, when Nietzsche's talking about the eternal return, but yep. but things change. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, this is the <clears throat> place to be in the sense that you're always going to be, um, you're going to incarnate again, and you're going to... Death is not an end. Death is not an escape. Don't you think this is more um, kind of uh, metaphysically conversant with, um, like... In physics, non-locality and, hmm. you know, just like a holistic understanding of the universe. This is kind of the moral, yeah. metaphysical aspect of it. We, we've been describing it with quantum physics mm-hmm. materially. But right. But being like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think our... Yeah, I'm kind of getting... Our physical understanding has ethical implications that we haven't even begun to work out um, because of the bifurcation that you were mentioning earlier between nature and culture we think yeah it doesn't matter what our physical universe is ultimately because our ethics is totally detached from that because uh-huh. from this materialist point of view it's all made up <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah 
But if you take quantum... That's a disturbing thing to believe, you know? Yeah. People do not live that way. But if we take physics seriously as, as having ethical implications, then there's actually a lot of resources there to think in the way that we have been about how, you know, um, nothing is, no energy can be created or destroyed. And that means that whatever we are now as conscious beings and agents, which we directly experience, will have to flow back into the larger system of which it is a part, out of which it emerged. I mean, like, where else do we think we go? You want to hear something kind of strange to consider? Yes, but let's get past oh, yeah. this car park, okay. this highway. It's stopping. Resume. So, <clears throat> the idea that I was going to share was one that I found hard to... Well, it's a... Yeah, I'll just tell you. You can decide what you think. Um, you know how you were saying that what, which law of thermodynamics is it that no energy can be destroyed? That's the first one. Okay. Well, Steiner says it's wrong. <laughs> That's what Steiner said. Yeah. And he said so does that Whitehead. <laughs> it's actually the human being at some, like, core of our being that is destroying things mm, mm-hmm. through our perception. Mm. And thinking, right? Yeah. Thinking, yes. So it's, I guess, related to, you know, his different bodies. But that's a really interesting idea. Because I feel like that's related to also, you could relate that to the climate crisis, the ecological crisis. And it's not just, that's what I found kind of radical with Steiner. It's like, it was like, yes, there's actually a way of perceiving the world that kills it. And you have to, you're like killing it basically as you perceive it. And that it's been part of the development of the human perception. Mm. And so there's this necessity to grow into a a relationship with the world that doesn't continue to kill it. Is this what Steiner called the redemption of thinking? Yeah. To allow us to enact living thinking instead of dead thinking. Yeah. Dead thinking that also kills what it attempts to think. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this involves recognizing a sort of, I guess what he would call a body-free or super-sensible form of thinking. Yeah. It's just, like, uh, I guess an aspect of our being that is ontologically prior to our organism. The organism permits it um, to be, I guess, individually experienced. So we were talking about this the other day, and yeah, you're right with the conservation of energy. It's sort of, it can be challenged, and Whitehead does for different reasons or in a different way than yeah. Steiner. Um, it's interesting to compare them. Yeah. Um, he says it doesn't necessarily need to be rejected, the, the, the first law of thermodynamics, but it just... Um, it can't be proven either. And so when you talk yeah. about life or mind as having some, like, influence over what happens, uh, it suggests that, you know, material mechanistic cause and effect, the flow of the substance of energy is not all there is. There's other... There's, yeah. a, there's a diversion of energy by a mind that makes my hand go up when I will it, you know, or the words be articulated when I think them or when will to speak them um, so that seems like an interruption of the flow of heat the thermodynamics right yeah um, <clears throat> but well you know um, the ancients have always you know there's the four elements in fire and when too the fire has been associated especially among the Greeks uh, with the kind of most I guess spiritual and like a kind of most transcendent Mm -hmm. um and light and mind you know i think thinking about it as if as if they're like actually the sources of manifestation Mm -hmm. and so that that energy is like fire it's like light like what produces light and it's ontologically prior to materialization Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you think about it, it's kind of like turning the the I guess typical understanding of from materialism on its head. 
Well, this is why Whitehead would agree with Steiner that there is something more ontologically primordial than um, energy, then he would call it creativity. Yeah. Energy is like... That's great, because it's... A way of measuring... It's not just an object, right? No, it's an activity. Yeah, and it's got like an interior kind of... It pre-exists. Well, it doesn't really exist. It's it's primordial, and it... Yeah. Um, it is the sort of condition that makes possible and actual our capacity for thinking and free action. Yeah. Um, I, I think, mean, yeah. Go ahead. Well, just that, you know, usually creativity is thought of as something that only humans can do. Yeah. But he, what he's <clears throat> saying, nope, that's the very basis of the universe. More a fountain than a foundation, but it's the source out of which everything arises <clears throat> and into which it perishes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was just thinking that so this that's really great. Um, uh, the term creativity from... Sh- uh, Whitehead as a mathematician because, you know, I imagine he was aware of a lot of these you know, um, I guess quadrivium type mm-hmm. um, beauties I guess, or harmonies in nature and that you know, I imagine creativity cause, but it's not always like, perfect right? And so creativity is a really nice concept uh, that mm-hmm. You know, that kind of, uh, I guess, corrects after Romanticism, Platonism. Yeah, um, the idea of static perfection. Yeah, yeah, and brings more of the kind of primal life force into the shaping, into, well, yeah, into beauty Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as creativity. But it's not just the life force, it's also the death force, or it's the mystery of the life-death-rebirth cycle. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's like it's yeah. creative and destructive at the same time. It's you know, and it was touching earlier again on uh, on the fi- element of fire in relation to light and ideas and the divine, because mm-hmm. um, that's what the Greeks associated you know the fire element with the divine, and I think of um, you know the uh, many. I guess when you talk about the, like, kundalini awakening, where there's, like, a current of energy that is, like, fire that runs through the human being, Mm -hmm. and that is associated with, um, I guess, super sensible perception. Yeah. Yeah. And that kundalini is what? You think that's the bodily manifestation of this cosmic creativity? Um... Yeah, and its relationship with individual, like, reincarnated eyes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But what is the significance of the body, then? Like, the physical body, like... <clears throat> it's the temple. It's the temple. Yeah. Mm. And so it's the... So the spirit worships the body, or the spirit worships in the body... Yes. Or as the body. In and as. Hmm. I like that. The body as the temple of the spirit. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what um, Plato says in Timaeus. Or Timaeus says of the universe and the human being. That's what Paul says in the New Testament too. My body is my temple. Yeah, it's a beautiful statement. There's a a quote from Hildegard in the Book of Divine Works that I really love where she's talking about the soul and how the soul just yearns to be back with God. Um, And it just feels sometimes the wretchedness of the body. But then she says, but then when it drops its body, it realizes how much the body permitted it to, you know, worship and praise, and it wants to go right back to the body and celebrate or something like that. It was just something beautiful, mm. kind of a paradoxical appreciation. That's the, why the reincarnation happens. Yeah. Hildegard is so much more earth-affirming mm-hmm. and body-affirming. So... 
I think that's probably a good place to tie a bow on this particular uh, discussion of the evolution of consciousness, the importance of reincarnation, the peril, the perils of materialism yes. as a philosophy and the impact that that worldview has on the social situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs>